Some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction ice is also great and would suffice. This poem by American poet Robert Frost was one of the inspirations for George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. The poem presents the dichotomy between ice and fire and how both of those might contribute to the end of the world, with the subject at first taking the option that it will be fire, but then positioning ice as just as likely. Fire and ice are not only physical objects in this poem, but also representatives of human emotions, with fire meaning desire and ice meaning hatred. The meaning of the poem seems to be very straightforward and has led people to position ice and fire as equal threats to the continent of Westeros, with ice representing the others and fire representing dragons. But the truth is far more complicated than that. Before we start, remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. The insistence that there is an equivalence between fire and ice as two equally destructive forces comes from the intuitive understanding of Frost's poem, as well as a statement George made in his conversation with Al Jazeera. Well, of course, the two outlying ones, the things that are going north of the wall and uh, Daenerys Targaryen on the other continent with her dragons are, are of course, the ice and fire of the, of the title, A Song of Ice and Fire. Because George mentions Daenerys in conjunction with the others, and because the poem does seem to present fire and ice as equally destructive forces, many fans were led to believe that this is also true for the story that used this poem for its title that Daenerys is an equal threat to Westeros as the others. This theory always existed, but gained traction after the show, where a speculation arose about how maybe the reversal of storylines, with the struggle in King's Landing becoming the final plot point rather than the fight against the others, is something that came from George R. R. Martin himself. For years we had this crazy build-up to the fight against the existential threat, but what comes after that? Could it be that Danny burning King's Landing is George's variant of the scorching of the Shire? In order to understand why and how George was inspired by this poem and what it means for the story, we must delve deeper into the circumstances of its conception and analyze the various possible interpretations of it. As we go further, you will be surprised at how many different things this short and frankly simple poem can mean. Harlow Shapley, an astronomer working at Harvard, had once recounted an anecdote of Frost approaching him at a party and asking a poignant question. How is the world going to end? A puzzled Shapley eventually answered. I told him that either the Earth would be incinerated or a permanent ice age would gradually annihilate all life on Earth. Thus, the world would either end with fire or ice. Shapley believed that this response is what inspired Frost to write Fire and Ice, as the poem was published shortly afterwards. This is just one reading of the poem, though. Some go as far as to assert that interpreting Fire and Ice as being about the physical end of the world is actually a misreading of the poem, and that Frost's apparent straightforwardness is used to conceal a deeper meaning. Jeffrey Myers in Robert Frost A Biography actually believes that the inspiration for the poem Fire and Ice did not come from musings about the end of the world or astronomy, but from a passage from Dante's Inferno, in which one of the forms of punishments of the fiery hell are people plunged into ice, a lake so bound with ice, it did not look like water, but like glass. Right clear. I saw where sinners are preserved in ice. Some go a step further with the Inferno connections. John and Serio recounts the words of Lawrence Thompson, who posits a thesis that this poem is in fact a very, very concise summary of Inferno, the heat of love or passion and the cold of hate. These two extremes are made so to encompass life as to be a gathering up of all that may exist between them all that might be swept away by them. But by linking it to Inferno, it presents a much more profound distinction between the two extremes of love and hate. Like Dante, 
Frost follows Aristotle in condemning hatred as far worse than desire. Serio then elaborates. But it is at the thematic level that Frost most tellingly follows Dante, for the poem reflects the same systems of ethics that Dante employs to classify the sins and punishments of hell. In reading the Inferno, readers are often puzzled by Dante's arrangement, because flatterers, fortune tellers, hypocrites, thieves, even counterfeiters are placed below murderers. The explanation that Dante provides derives from Aristotle. Sins of reason are worse than sins of passion. Aristotle observes that what distinguishes human beings from other life forms is reason. Therefore, human beings must function with reason in order to fulfill their maximum potential. Dante modifies this principle by adding that reason is God's greatest gift to humankind, and therefore its perversion or misuse constitutes the worst possible sin. But since fraud is the vice of which man alone is capable, God loves it most. All the damned know they have committed sin, but those in the upper circles such as the carnal, the gluttons, the hoarders and wasters, the angry and sullen, let passion sway their reason. Those in middle hell such as the murderers, warmongers, suicides and homosexuals exercise emotion in alignment with reason. Violent though some of their actions may be, these sinners do what they think. But those in lower hell, the flatterers, hypocrites, thieves, and those who have betrayed family and country, exercise deceit. They use their reason to camouflage their true intent, and thus pervert the proper use, according to Dante, of God's most distinctive gift to humans. Those in the ninth circle, the traitors to friends, family and country, are frozen in ice, a most fitting punishment for their icy hearts. Though logically all the sinners in hell suffer the same consequences, eternal separation from the presence and love of God, those in the lower regions of hell have committed more serious sins and suffer more. Frost's Fire and Ice contains this same organizational pattern. The understated opening two lines, some say the world will end in fire, some say in ice, at first seems merely to suggest the biblical and scientific predictions about the end of the world, an apocalyptic holocaust or new ice age. However, as figurative representations of desire and hatred, fire and ice embody the very system of Aristotelian ethics Dante employs in arranging the inferno. Sins of reason are worse than sins of passion. Frost associates fire with the senses and places it first, or so to speak, near the top of his poem, as the lesser of the two types of sin, from what I've tasted of desire, I hope with those who favor fire. In addition, by aligning the poem's speaker with a group of others, I hold with those who favor fire, Frost implies this is a more common and less serious sin. When Frost speaks of hatred, however, instead of seeing it as an emotion or feeling, like anger, he presents it as a consequence of thought, of conscious choice. I think I know enough of hate. To say that for destruction lies is also great and would suffice. The emphasis here, as in Dante, is on reason, or better, on the perversion or misuse of reason, because it is employed not for Christian love, but for hatred. The intellectual distancing contained in the repetition, I think I know, the change from the present perfect tense, implying a past action, I've tasted, to the present tense, I think I know, and the utter isolation of the repeated T without any reference to others, mark hatred as worse than desire. Frost underscores this by making it the cause of a second death, but if it had to perish twice, far more terrible by implication than the first. Thus, it seems like Fire and Ice was never about how Fire and Ice possesses equal powers of distraction, though it might seem so at first glance. A deeper reading of the poem and the connection to Inferno shows that while Fire is not entirely absolved, it is Ice that is actually condemned. Thus, the world as we know will end in Ice. But by the virtue of being a poem, many different interpretations of it are of course allowed. Do we know whether George shares this literal understanding of fire and ice, or if he agrees with Serio? We actually do. When asked about whether Frost's poem influenced him in any way, he says, Of course I was, I mean, fire is love, fire is passion, fire is sexual ardor and all those things. Ice is betrayal, ice is revenge, ice is, you know, that kind of cult in humanity, and all that stuff is being played out in the books. George is very clearly not drawing an equivalence here. He describes fire as a matter of love, passion and sexual ardor, whereas he casts judgment on ice, betrayal, revenge, cold in humanity. 
Words very similar to how Dante describes those who received the ultimate punishment in the ninth circle. Crimes of the misuse of reason. <laughs> Fire is, of course, not always a force of good. It's not like Frost and Dante praise devices of crimes of passion that are linked to fire. But ice is decisively positioned as wars, there is no equivalence in between them. Thus, from this we can infer that Dante and her dragons and the others are not equal threats to Westeros. And come to think of it, it's kind of absurd to think so. Why would a teen girl be positioned as an equal threat to eldritch monsters set on enslaving everyone into their army of the dead? I know what Danny critics will say. Well, maybe unstable, power-hungry tyrant, future mad queen, teenage girls shouldn't wield nuclear weapons. The discussion about dragons as nuclear weapons and the fantasy fandom's pathological hatred of fantastical creatures is related to the discussion we're having right now and how George's offhand comment was used to further, among other things, the narrative that fire and ice are equally bad. But that's for another day. As of now, let's take serious interpretation of fire and ice and see how it applies to our story. Fire is quite dichotomic in nature. Fire is life, fire is civilization, fire is warmth. But fire is also destruction, pain and death. In spite of this, fire is often only understood as a force of destruction, especially in the context of A Song of Ice and Fire. Like I said, it's not like Serio's interpretation of the poem is fire good, ice bad. It's ice is far worse than fire. Fire has its vices, but is, in a way, redeemable. Dana's dragons are linked to life and death already, chiefly by Dana's own title, Mother of Dragons. Mother is someone that brings forth life, and the life she brought is capable of creating death and destruction. Here's that dichotomy which is beautifully united in the character of Daenerys Targaryen, the Mother of Dragons. In my purely subjective opinion, Ice does not have that dichotomy. Maybe because I was always the type to hate winter and love summer, but Ice seems total, Ice seems… well… Cold and calculated, Machiavellian, total, signifying only death and inhumanity, the way Dante and Frost link it to that kind of cold hatred. Since George expressed similar sentiments, we can search for it in the story proper. A Game of Thrones prologue. What do you think might have killed this man, Jared? Sir Weimar asked casually. He had just had the drape of his long sable cloak. It was the cold, Jared said with iron certainty. I saw men freeze last winter and the one before, when I was half a boy. Everyone talks about snows 40 foot deep, and how the ice wind comes howling out of the north. But the real enemy is the cold. It steals up on you, quieter than will, and at first you shiver, and your teeth chatter, and you stamp your feet and dream of mulled wine and nice hot fires. It burns, it does. Nothing burns like the cold. But only for a while. Then it gets inside you and starts to fill you up, and after a while you don't have the strength to fight it. It's easier just to sit down or go to sleep. They say you don't feel any pain toward the end. First you go weak and drowsy, and everything starts to fade. And then it's like sinking into a sea of warm milk. Peaceful-like. After this event, the three members of the Night's Watch encountered the others. The others made no sound. Will saw movement from the corner of his eye. Pale shapes gliding through the wood. He turned his head, glimpsed a white shadow in the darkness. Then it was gone. Branches stirred gently in the wind, scratching at one another with wooden fingers. Will opened his mouth to call a warning, and the words seemed to freeze in his throat. Perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps it had only been a bird, a reflection on the snow, some trick of the moonlight. What had he seen after all? Will, where are you? Sir Weimar called up. Can you see anything? He was turning in a slow circle, suddenly worried, his sword in hand. He must have felt them, as Will felt them. There was nothing to see. Answer me! Why is it so cold? It was cold. Shivering, Will clung more tightly to his perch. His face pressed hard against the trunk of the sentinel. He could feel the sweet, sticky sap on his cheek. A shadow emerged from the dark of the wood. It stood in front of Royce. Tall it was, and gaunt and hard as old bones, with flesh pale as milk. Its armor seemed to change color as it moved. Here it was white as new fallen snow. There was black as shadow, everywhere dappled with the deep grey-green of the trees. The patterns ran like moonlight on water with every step it took. Will heard the breath go out of Sir Weimar Royce in a long hiss. Come no farther, the Lordling warned. His voice cracked like a boy's. He threw the long sable cloak back over his shoulders to free his arms for battle. 
and took his sword in both hands. The wind had stopped. It was very cold. The other sit forward on silent feet. In its hand was a long sword like none that Will had ever seen. No human metal had gone into the forging of that blade. It was alive with moonlight, translucent, a shard of crystal so thin that it seemed almost to vanish when seen edge on. There was a faint blue shimmer to the thing, a ghost light that played around its edges, and somehow Will knew it was sharper than any riser. Sir Waymar met him bravely. Dance with me then. He lifted his sword high over his head, defiant. His hands trembled from the weight of it, or perhaps from the cold. Yet in that moment, Will thought he was a boy no longer, but a man of the Night's Watch. The other halted. Will saw its eyes, blue, deeper and bluer than any human eyes, a blue that burned like ice. They fixed on the long sword, trembling on high, watched the moonlight running cold along the metal. For a heartbeat, he dared to hope. They emerged silently from the shadows, twins to the first, three of them, four, five. Sir Weimar might have felt the cold that came with them, but he never saw them, never heard them. Will had to call out. It was his duty, and his death if he did. He shivered and hugged the tree, and kept the silence. The pale sword came shivering through the air. Sir Weimar met it with steel. When the blades met, there was no ring of metal on metal, only a high, thin sound at the edge of hearing, like an animal screaming in pain. Roy checked a second blow, and a third, then fell back a step. Another flurry of blows, and he fell back again. Behind him, to right, to left, all around him, the watchers stood patient, faceless, silent, the shifting patterns of their delicate armor, making them all but invisible in the wood. Yet they made no move to interfere. Again and again the swords met, until Will wanted to cover his ears against the strange, anguished kinning of their clash. Sir Weimar was panting from the effort now, his breath steaming in the moonlight. His blade was white with frost, the others danced with pale blue light. Then Royce's parry came a bit too late. The pale sword bit through the ringmail beneath his arm. The young lord cried out in pain. Blood welled between the rings. It steamed in the cold, and the droplets seemed red as fire when they touched the snow. Sewarmar's fingers brushed his side. His moleskin glove came away soaked with red. The other said something in a language that Will did not know. His voice was like the cracking of ice on a winter lake, and the words were mocking. Sir Weimar Royce found his fury. For Robert, he shouted, and he came up snarling, lifting the frost covered longsword with both hands and swinging it around in a flat sidearm slash with all his weight behind it. The other's parry was almost lazy. When the blades touched, the steel shattered. A scream echoed through the forest night, and the longsword shivered into a hundred brittle pieces, the shards scattering like a rain of needles. Royce went to his knees, shrieking, and covered his eyes. Blood welled between his fingers. The watchers moved forward together, as if some signal had been given. Swords rose and fell, all in a deathly silence. It was called butchery. The pale blades sliced through ring mail, as if it were silk. Will closed his eyes. Far beneath him, he heard their voices and laughter, sharp as icicles. When he found the courage to look again, a long time had passed, and the ridge below was empty. He stayed in a tree, scarce daring to breathe, while the moon crept slowly across the black sky. Finally, his muscles cramping and his fingers numb with cold, he climbed down. Royce's body lay face down in the snow, one arm unflung. The thick sable clock had been slashed in a dozen places. Lying dead like that, you saw how young he was. A boy. He found what was left of the sword, a few feet away. The end splintered and twisted like a tree struck by lightning. Will knelt, looked around worriedly, and snatched it up. The broken sword would be his proof. Jared would know what to make of it. And if not him, then surely that old bear Mormont or Maester Amon. Would Jared still be waiting with the horses? He had to hurry. Will rose. Sir Weimar Royce stood over him. His fine clothes were a tatter, his face a ruin. A shard from his sword transfixed the blind white pupil of his left eye. The right eye was open. The pupil burned blue. It saw. The broken sword fell from Nervous's fingers. Will closed his eyes to pray. Long, elegant hands brushed his cheek, then tightened around his throat. They were gloved in the finest molar skin and sticky with blood, yet the touch was icy cold. Then, in the very last chapter of book one, another magical event happens. Danny took the torch from Agus' hand and thrust it between the logs. They all took the fire at once. They brushed and dried grass a heartbeat later. 
Tiny flames went darting up the wood, like swift red mice, skating over the oil and leaping from bark to branch to leaf. A rising heat puffed at her face, soft and sudden as a lover's breath, but in seconds it had grown too hot to bear. Then he stepped backward. The wood cracked, louder and louder. Miri Mazdur began to sing in a shrill, ululating voice. The flames whirled and whirled, racing each other up to the platform. The dusk shimmered as the air itself seemed to liquefy from the heat. Then he heard long spits and crack. The fire swept over Miri Mazdur. Her song grew louder, shriller. Then she gasped again and again, and her song became a shuddering wail, thin and high and full of agony. And now the flames reached her drogo, and now they were all around him. His clothing took fire, and for an instant the cowl was clad in wisps of floating orange silk and tendrils of curling smoke, grey and greasy. Then the sleeps parted and she found herself holding her breath. Part of her wanted to go to him, as Sergio had feared, to rush into the flames to beg for his forgiveness and take him inside her one last time, the fire melting the flesh from their bones until they were as one forever. She could smell the odor of burning flesh, no different than horse flesh roasting in a fire pit. The pie rode in a deepening dusk like some great beast, drowning out the finer sound of Miri Mazdur's screaming and sending up long tanges of flame to lick at the belly of the night. As the smoke grew thicker, the Dothraki backed away, coughing. Huge orange gouts of fire unfurled their banners in that hellish wind, the dogs hissing and cracking, glowing cinders rising on the smoke to float away into the dark like so many newborn fireflies. The heat bat at the air with great red wings, driving the Dothraki back, driving off even Mormont, but then it stood her ground. She was the blood of the dragon, and the fire was in her. She had sensed the truth of it long ago, Danny thought, as she took a step closer to the conflagration, but the brazier had not been hot enough. The flames rattled before her like the woman who had danced at her wedding, whirling and singing and spinning their yellow and orange and crimson veils, fearsome to behold, yet lovely, so lovely, alive with heat. Danny opened her arms to them, her skin flushed and glowing. This is a wedding too, she thought. Miri Mazdur had fallen silent. The god's wife taught her a child, but children grow, and children learn. Another step, and Danny could feel the heat of the sand on the soles of her feet, even through her sandals. Sweat ran down her thighs and between her breasts, and in rivulets over her cheeks, where tears had once run. Sergera was shouting behind her, but he did not matter anymore. Only the fire muttered. The flames were so beautiful, the loveliest thing she had ever seen. Each one a sorcerer wrapped in yellow and orange and scarlet, swirling long smoky cloaks. She saw crimson fire lions, and great yellow serpents, and unicorns made out of pale blue flame. She saw fish and foxes and monsters, wolves and bright birds, and flowering trees, each more beautiful than the last. She saw a horse, a great grey stallion limbed in smoke, its flowing mane and nimbus of blue flame. Yes, my love, my sun and stars. Yes, mount now, tide now. Her vest had begun to smolder, so Danny shrugged it off and let it fall to the ground. The painted leather burst into sudden flame as she skipped closer to the fire, her breast bare to the blaze, streams of milk flowing from her red and swollen nipples. Now, she thought, now, and for an instant she glimpsed Cal Drogo before her, mounted on his smoky stallion, a flaming lash in his hand. He smiled, and the whip snaked down at the pyre, hissing. She heard a crack, the sound of shattering stone, the platform of wood began to shift and collapse in upon its soul. Bits of burning wood slid down at her, and Danny was showered with ash and cinders. And something else came crashing down, bouncing and rolling, to land at her feet. A chunk of carved rock, pale and vined with gold, broken and smoking. The roaring filled the world, yet dimly through the firefall, Danny heard women shriek and children cry out in wonder. Only death can pay for life. And there came a second crack, loud and sharp as thunder, and the smoke stirred and whirled around her, and the pyre shifted, the locks exploding as the fire touched their secret hearts. She heard the screams of frightened horses, and the voices of the Dothraki race in shouts of fear and terror, and Ser Jorah calling her name and cursing. No, she wanted to shout to him. No, my good knight, do not fear for me. The fire is mine. I am the nearest Storborn, daughter of dragons, bride of dragons, mother of dragons. Don't you see? Don't you see? With a belch of flame and smoke, that reached thirty feet into the sky, the pyre collapsed and came down around her. Unafraid, Danny stepped forward into the firestorm, calling to her children. The third crack was as loud and sharp as the breaking of the world. When the fire died at last, and the grounds became cool enough to walk upon, Sir Jorah Mormon found her amidst the ashes, 
surrounded by blackened logs and bits of glowing ember, and the burned bones of man and woman and stallion. She was naked, covered with soot, her clothes turned to ash, her beautiful hair all crisped away, yet she was unhurt. The cream and gold dragon was sucking at her left breast, the green and bronze at the right. Her arms cradled them close. The black and scarlet beast was draped across her shoulders, its long sinuous neck curled under her chin. When it saw Jora, it raised its head and looked at him with eyes as red as coals. Wordless, the knight fell to his knees. The men of her cast came up behind him. Drogo was the first to lay his arak at her feet. Blood of my blood, he murmured, pushing his face to the smoking earth. Blood of my blood, she heard Ago echo. Blood of my blood, Rakaro shouted. And after them came her handmaids, and then the others, all the Dothraki, men and women and children, and Dani had only to look at their eyes to know that they were hers now, today and tomorrow and forever. Hers as they had never been Drago's. As the nearest Targaryen rose to her feet, her black hissed, pale smoke venting from its mouth and nostrils. The other two pulled away from her breast and added their voices to the call, translucent wings unfolding and stirring the air. And for the first time in hundreds of years, the night came alive with the music of dragons. The placement of these events are not accidental. At the beginning of the book, we are told who is the real enemy, the cold, and we end the book with the solution to the enemy, dragons, fire, a force of life that may bring terrible destruction but nonetheless is the solution to the real enemy. Also, notice the kind of emotions that are present in these two scenes. Will and Weimar are scared and uneasy, while the nurse is ecstatic and hopeful. Coincidentally, before she wakes dragons from stone, the nurse has another peculiar dream. Wings shadowed her feather dreams. You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? She was walking down a long hall beneath high stone arches. She could not look behind her, must not look behind her. There was a door ahead of her, tiny with distance, but even from afar she saw that it was painted red. She walked faster, and her bare feet left bloody footprints on the stone. You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? Sir Jorah's face was drawn and sorrowful. Rhaegar was the last dragon, he told her. He warmed translucent hands over a glowing brazier, where stone eggs smoldered red as coals. One moment he was there, and the next he was fading, his flesh colorless, less substantial than the wind. The last dragon, he whispered, thin as a wisp, and was gone. She felt the dark behind her, and the red door seemed farther away than ever. Don't want to wake the dragon, do you? The red door was far ahead of her, and she could feel the icy breath behind, sweeping up on her. If it caught her, she would die a death that was more than death, howling forever alone in the darkness. She began to run. Don't want to wake the dragon. Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiments of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white and their eyes were opal and amethysts, tourmaline and jade. Faster, they cried. Faster, faster. She raced, her feet melting the stone whenever they touched. Faster, the ghosts cried as one, and she screamed and threw herself forward. A great knife of pain ripped down her back, and she felt her skin tear open and smelled the stench of burning blood and saw the shadow of wings. And the nearest Targaryen flew. Wake the dragon. The door loomed before her, the red door, so close, so close, the hell was a blur around her, the cold receding behind. And now the stone was gone, and she flew across the Dothraki Sea, high and higher, the green rippling beneath, and all that lived and breathed fled in terror from the shadow of her wings. She could smell home, she could see it. There, just beyond that door, green fields and great stone houses, and arms to keep her warm, there. She threw open the door, the dragon, and saw her brother Rhaegar, mounted on a stallion as black as his armor. Fire glimmered red through the narrow eye slit of his elm. The last dragon, Sir Jorah's voice whispered faintly. The last, the last. Then he lifted his polished black visor. The face within was her own. So, in this dream, the only way she can escape from that icy breath that will cause her something worse than death is to grow wings and fly, as a dragon. Conventional warfare will not work against the others, as retiated by torment in A Dance with Dragons. You know nothing. You killed a dead man, I, I heard. Man's killed a hundred. A man can fight the dead. But when their masters come, when the white mists rise up, how do you fight a mist crow? Shadows with teeth, air so cold it hurts to breathe, like a knife inside your chest. You do not know, you cannot know. Can your sword cut cold? Even a fiery sword, no matter how great, will be able to fight against the mist, shadows with teeth, and air so cold it hurts to breathe. But do you know what can? 
Dragons, Dragonfire, the metaphorical sword, Lightbringer. In a dance of dragons, Xarok Xandaxos says, When I went to the Hall of the Thousand Thrones to beg the pureborn for your life, I said that you were no more than a child, Xaro went on. But Egon Emeros, the exquisite, rose and said, She is a foolish child, mad and heedless and too dangerous to live. When your dragons were small, they were a wonder. Grown, they are death and devastation, a flaming sword above the world. Pretty ironic how the slavers speak the same words about Daenerys and her dragons as the fandom, but let me just let it slide this one time, because I want to point something else. I think it's not a coincidence that Xaro, a slaver, is the one to link Daenerys' dragons to a sword. That's because the slavers themselves are linked to ice. The others are also enslaving the death in their army. Tormund also calls them masters. In A Dance of Dragons, Danny has a very peculiar dream. Beneath her coverlets, she tossed and turned, dreaming that his there was kissing her. But his lips were blue and bruised, and when he thrust himself inside her, his manhood was cold as ice. Earlier, right before Danny's maneuver with the Unsullied, she also has a peculiar dream. That night she dreamt that she was Rhaegar, riding to the Trident, but she was mounted on a dragon, not a horse. When she saw the usurper's rebel host across the river, they were armored all in ice, but she bathed them in dragon fire and they melted away like dew and turned the trident into a torrent. Some small part of her knew she was dreaming, but another part exulted. This is how it was meant to be. The other was a nightmare, and I have only now awakened. Coincidentally, it is in Daenerys' chapters where the dichotomy of ice and fire tends to be mentioned the most. When Daenerys forms the pyre for Drago, she unites the dichotomies of the world, including ice and fire. Over the carcass of the horse, they build a platform of hewn legs, trunks of smaller trees and limbs from the greater, and the thickest, straightest branches they could find. They laid the wood east to west, from sunrise to sunset. The third level of the platform was woven of branches no thicker than a finger, and covered with dry leaves and twigs. They laid them north to south, from ice to fire, and piled them high with soft cushions and flipping silks. In A Clash of Kings in the House of the Undying, Daenerys sees a vision of Rhaegar, Elia, and baby Aegon. Aegon, he said to a woman, nursing a newborn babe in the great wooden bed. What better name for a king? Will you make a song for him? The woman asked. He has a song, the man replied. He is the prince that was promised, and his is the song of ice and fire. He looked up when he said it, and his eyes met Danny's, and it seemed as if he saw her standing there beyond the door. There must be one more, he said, though whether he was speaking to her or the woman in the bed, she could not say. The dragon has three heads. In House of the Dragon, we learn that A Song of Ice and Fire is the name Aegon gave to the dream that he had. He foresaw the threat from beyond the wall and united Westeros so that it is better prepared against this fight. While House of the Dragon is not canon, this information came directly from George R. R. Martin, so we may assume that this revelation will be crucial in the future books. Though people really hate this reveal, even though this is a confirmation of a quite old theory. Shortly afterwards, Danny meets the Undying and the dichotomy of ice and fire is mentioned once more. I have come for the gift of truth, Danny said. In the young hall, the things I saw, were there true visions or lies? Past things or things to come? What did they mean? The shape of shadows, morrows not yet made. Drink from the cup of ice, drink from the cup of fire. Mother of dragons, child of tree. In the Hedge Knight, we also learn that the summers have been shorter since the last dragon died, and the winters longer and crueler. There is a fairly convincing theory that the ice and fire have to be in some sort of a balance for the world to be at peace, and after the dragons died, the others could rise once more due to magic disappearing from the world. But after Danny's dragons are born, magic becomes stronger. A fine trick, announced Jogo with admiration. No trick, a woman said in the common tongue. Danny had not noticed Quaid in the crowd, yet there she stood, eyes wet and shiny, behind the implacable, red like her mask. What mean you, my lady? Half a year ago, that man could scarcely wake fire from dragon glass. He had some small skills with powders and wildfire, sufficient to entrace a crowd while his cut purses did their work. He could walk across hot coals and make burning roses bloom in the air. But he could no more aspire to climb the fiery ladder than a common fisherman could hope to catch a kraken in his nets. Then he looked uneasily at where the ladder had stood. Even the smoke was gone now, and the crowd was breaking up, each man going about his business. In a moment, more than a few would find their purses flat and empty. And now? And now his powers grow, Khaleesi. And you are the cause of it. Me, she laughed. How could that be? The woman stepped closer and laid two fingers on Dan's wrists. You are the mother of dragons, are you not? 
Some Asango Fasin Fae fans have been very invested in the idea that magic is bad and that dragons especially are bad. But clearly we see that it's not the case. When dragons died, magic left the world, which caused winters to be longer, and that in turn likely gave rise to the others. But when dragons returned, magic became stronger. Hence, from all of this, we can infer that dragons are what will defeat the threat. The ultimate and final threat from the ninth circle. Ice. The others. The enemy final in its totality. This is also why I personally don't like the theory that Nanis three dragons will die during the struggle against the others, and the story will conclude with Majin once more leaving the world. First, it would be narratively cheap. I know that for us, three decades have passed at this point, but calculations made by fans show that only about two or so years have passed since the beginning of the story. Of course, it's hard to say how much time will pass in Winds and Dream, but what would be the point of bringing dragons back from extinction in such a miraculous way, only to make them extinct again, a few years later at best? Less than two centuries have passed since the death of dragons and the rise of others. If the dragons were to die again, the entire process of the return of others would resume. Unless, of course, this time the others are defeated for good, never to be seen again. But still, it would be pretty unsatisfying to bring dragons back from extinction just to kill them all off again. I believe that they are here to stay, to make sure others can never return again. <laughs> Part of the reason why people so dislike the reveal in House of the Dragon about how the Targaryens are not the villains of this story and they will be crucial in the fight against the others is because it is a very obstacle in the Mad Queen theory. Many of them wanted the Targaryens and dragons to not play a role in the final fight at all. No doubt the ice and fire are actually equally bad is how they try to spin it to their preferred turn. At this point, it's very hard to deny that Danny will take part in the fight against the others, though some still try, so they try to use, among other things, Frost's poem to argue in favor of George's spin on the scorching of the Shire. And of course, it's not like you're limited to only one interpretation of this poem, but George clearly agrees with the in-depth interpretation. That much is certain from his own words. Fire is love and passion, while ice is cold in humanity. Thus, a song of ice and fire will not end with a Game of Thrones in King's Landing. There will be no scorching of the Shire. Ice is the final adversary. Fire and ice are not equally destructive forces. Fire is the antithesis of ice and the thing that will eventually see the defeat of ice. Daenerys Targaryen and her dragons will not be the final villain of this series. Thanks for watching. Remember that if you like my content, like, subscribe and share so that more people can see it. Make sure to click the notification button so that you never miss a new video. And remember, ashes land on top. Thank you.